Hi. Um, yeah, I did come a long way, and the story I will not tell you about is how, and this is true, my pants fell down going through security in Los Angeles Airport. <laughs> they did. Uh, thanks to James, Scott, and Tom for making this possible. Thanks to Ken Edwards and Reality Street for publishing the book. Um, and thank you, Manchester. I have never knowingly been in Manchester. <laughs> I will read, there are two copies of the book uh, in back, so you can fight over it when, when we're all done. Um, I will read what you might call the prelude to the book. I call it the prelude. And then I'll read a story, a very short story from it. It's a book of uh, interrelated short stories. And <clears throat> the material in the story that has to do with a world historical prophet still alive in America and his John the Baptist, the material about them in the story is all factual. But first the prelude. My body tingles and my eyes water. Bows scraping, mouths wetting reeds, fingers toughened by bass strings. It's physical, but I am wearing a suit. My collar is tight. The players wear black dresses, suits. Don't their clothes restrain them from doing what they drive me to feel? Music is a dog that changes when you move to the country. It explores your property, makes it his with strategic sprays. It barks at squirrels, birds, and butterflies, and digs up rodent holes. It disappears for hours that worry you if you notice. For you've moved out there to do your work at last. There's a new tone to its barking and growling deeper from the chest, higher, out of control, bugling and screeching that give your friends pause when they arrive. And the blood, where did the blood on its mouth and shoulders come from? You worry it's been wounded, but you can, fi you can find no scratches or holes on a body whose hair seems coarser and which suffers your touch without affectionate preening. But your work engrosses you, and you pay less attention to the dog than you did in the city when you, were need when you needed attention and affection focused on you because you felt abused by your job, your family, or yourself. When you were so needy, the licking, the hot breath, the 60-pound body launching its needs at you, satisfied like a huge, sticky cinnamon roll. Looks more familiar now. <laughs> I just improvised. All that. <laughs> Music is a dog. That's where we were. <laughs> It plunged its nose under the tails of your friend's dogs when they visited from the city, distracting your visitors from their compliments to your tasteful new place as you kissed them noisily on both cheeks, their pets curling up and cringing in corners to protect their vents. When Custer was obliterated, Brahms took friends to dinner to celebrate the Indians. The woodwinds combined with brass and strings in what my music appreciation teacher called thick harmony, his lips moist, the timpani booming, surge at me. And I wonder for the 459th time whether I'm correct 
to allow music access to my nervous system. Whether it is in fact an abstract evolution of mathematical interrelations, a game the composer and the musicians play, while the uninitiated like me pant over them, ignorant as a dog. If you could lie down in the auditorium as you now can on certain large airplanes, if you could make love to your partner instead of contenting yourself with holding her hand with her hand on her thigh or on your thigh, if the bed could be by huge windows giving on the bay, if you could cease to distract yourself by wondering if your partner wants to hold your hand, likes your clothing, or wishes you were dressing, dressed like the thinner man in the better seats three rows down to the left, and if your bladder would stay empty despite the tea you drank to sharpen your senses, maybe you could be a music whose moist tingling you could discharge ecstatically between her thighs. The, la the lassitude that had, had absorbed, released, <coughs> and banished my parents' inhibitions of me, a parousia more engulfing than my dog's ecstasy wriggling on his back, or a killer's triumph bagging his prey. The blood surging through me, maximally oxygenated, words, words, that shoot from my past to perforate my presence, released, gone, and I would be music, music. So this is a story with a very long title, L. <laughs> L intended to marry his college sweetheart, and that didn't work. But after he dropped her, she produced their son, who failed to interest him. He became president of his family's company, which went south, his career with it, and his relatives alleging improprieties, pursued him like balance sheet furies. He tried writing, but failed to keep his children's books free of his bitterness. He studied the history, ecology, and the political economy of his region as, dependent on the girlfriend who materialized while he was president, he became more and more expert on how the world works. He damned his lineage and his luck. When he reached 50, he went on a diet and worked out rigorously in Gold's gym. His hair receded, but his musculature was that of a college boy. His girlfriend was promoted, and they moved to a suburban house from which he could commute downtown to her, from which she could commute downtown to her actuarial duties. His files of crucial information filled the house, and it became embarrassing to entertain. Not a problem, because her work busied her so, and because his bitterness increased with his knowledge. He felt himself constantly on the edge of the discovery his mental and physical exercise brought ever nearer. His relatives believed he was addicted to cocaine. The closer we get, by blood or involvement, the less we, under, the less we know L. A principle governing the acuity of L awareness, from relatives to siblings, to his mother who disowned him, and to L himself. I am his brother. I am struggling with my poverty of emotional insight. But I am a Protestant brought up to believe that effort is its own reward, and I am persisting to the brink of putting my brother's case to bed. In June of 2004, our collective Western culture absorbed a shock worse than a body blow. Bob Dylan, whose purity of intentions is a pillar 
or at least a brick in our cultural edifice, sold out. <laughs> Lending his wrinkled, grizzled visage to advertisements for underwear covering while uncovering the breasts and pelvises of women young enough to be his grandchildren. My brother believes deeply in Bob Dylan. <laughs> Secondly, my wife was a textile designer before computers outsourced her work to themselves. And she designed the tissue paper that nestles against the underwear to which Bob Dylan <laughs> scandalously lent his haggard visage. <laughs> My wife has two pairs of panties from this company, one purple, one emerald. Each sports a small bow in line with her navel. The flesh around her navel is softer and smoother than my dreams of flesh. The panties have remained fresh and shapely since 1993. Unlike any other panties in our collection of underwear, I'm certain because I wash them. My brother works at home, like me. His girlfriend's name, like that of many of her upper bourgeois Protestant coevals, could be a man's name, and it is associated with the finer grades of a precious metal. Bob Dylan is a pseudonym. If you look at the covers of his early legendary acoustic albums, you see the pleasantly hermaphroditic image of Poor or of a clown. My wife's name is very feminine, as is its diminutive. And it can be associated with British royalty, with intercessory religious icons, and with a wealthy American colony. When Woody Guthrie, Bob Dylan's icon, wrote about the famous river he fluently and movingly sent to roll on through our hearts, he was in the pay of Uncle Sam whose engineers were blasting and scraping to dam that river, inundating lands and caves sacred to the humans closest to native on this continent. I cannot say that I have made a surplus of overtures to my estranged brother, but I have made all the overtures. And when we are together, it is painful, for as he makes his points about political economy, about his luck and his lineage, he hits me on my biceps and triceps with the backs of his fingers. It is clear to me, as I ponder these clues, that my brother's crisis, or stasis, stretching back to before the record bull markets we have enjoyed, has to do with his substituting Bob Dylan for his father. <laughs> confusing Bob Dylan with his brother, putting Bob Dylan between himself and his son, between him and his lover. When I graduated from college, I went to a liberal Protestant seminary in New York. I always intended to do good. My use of cocaine back east was minimal and unsatisfactory. <laughs> I do my best to forgive my brother for his malevolence towards me and towards my sisters, mothers, fathers, uncles, and cousins. I thank God for inventing secular humanism during the Renaissance and the Reformation, for it has freed me to worship the fertile field of my wife's belly and not the false prophecies of a commercial icon, the condemnation of whose repulsive image is inevitable to anyone who beholds it adjacent to the exposed flesh of once innocent maidens sacrificed to the Moloch of our popular culture. <laughs> <laughs>